same content and yet preach it in a little different way without changing the content. So I have a little different approach this morning as I bring you a message, the title of which is The Gospel in Four Gardens. The Gospel in Four Gardens. And we're going to stand together and read Genesis chapter 2, verse 8 through 10 and verse 15 through 17, and you will find it in your bulletin. I would prefer you use the bulletin because uh, there's a break in the Scripture reading. So if you use the bulletin, we won't have any uh, confusion. So let's stand together, please, in deference to the Word of God. And we'll begin to read. I'll read verse 7, and you read verse 8, and so on, down through verse 17. And the Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. And man became a living soul. And, and the Lord God planted a garden and there he put the man whom he had formed. And out of the ground made the Lord God to grow every tree that is pleasant to the sight and good for food, the tree of life also in the midst of the garden and the tree of knowledge of good and evil. And a river went out of it to water the garden and from this he walked the park and came to four heads. And the Lord God took the man and put him into the garden of Eden to dress it and to keep it. And the Lord God commanded the man, saying, Of every tree of the garden thou mayest freely eat, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil thou shalt not eat of it, 
For in the day that thou eatest thereof, thou shalt surely die. Thank you. Be seated, please. My message today is on the gardens of God. The gospel in four gardens. There are over 50 gardens mentioned in the Bible. The Bible begins with a garden and ends with a garden. In Genesis chapter 2, you have the garden mentioned five times in just a few verses. Our first garden will be the Garden of Eden. The Garden of Eden was a garden of testing as to obedience. And I would have you to notice in verses 7 through 17 that five different times you read of a garden. When God says something five different times in just a few verses, that means stop, look, and listen. He's put the word garden there for a very special purpose, which I'll explain later as we go along. The Garden of Eden was where Adam and Eve were placed by Almighty God. Now we have preachers today that telling us that Adam and Eve were not real people. It's just a, a soliloquy or a symbol. But the Bible says that Adam and Eve were real persons. They were placed in the Garden of Eden and it was in this garden that man fell and became polluted. Not only did Adam fall, but when Adam fell, I fell. When Adam fell, you fell. For Adam was our federal head. He was our representative. And what he did in regard to his obedience to God affected you and I. For we were all in the loins of Adam as our representative. And when he fell, we all fell. When Adam fell, he died spiritually. And when he fell, we all died spiritually. That's why the Bible says in Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 1, And you hath he quickened, that is, made alive, who were dead in trespasses and in sins. So we all fell in the Garden of Eden with Adam. It was a garden of testing. God said, Adam, you can have the run of the garden. And of all these luscious fruit trees, you can eat anything you want. But of the garden and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, you shall not eat of it, for in the day thou eatest thereof, thou shalt surely die. Man has no explanation as to why man is spiritually dead except going back to this fall of Adam. It was a garden of testing as to obedience. If Adam had stood and obeyed God, there would never have been such a thing as death. There would never have been such a thing as sin. There would never have been such a thing as tragedy, heartache, and tears. All of this is a result of what happened in the first garden when Adam chose to rebel against his Creator and to shake his fist in the his fist in the face of God and say, I will have my own way. Now, my dear friends, this morning, rebellion is as the sin, the Bible says, as witchcraft. If there's anything that God hates, it is rebellion in His creatures. He hated it when Adam committed it, and He hates it today when sinners commit it. When they rebel against the Gospel, when they rebel against the Ten Commandments, when they rebel against the will of God. God hates it when men rebel and become rebels. And God, may I say this, God has no rebels in His family. If you are a rebel against God, it's because you're not in His family. It's because you've never been saved. God has no rebels in His family. I was a rebel. There was a day when I lived as a rebel. But the night I heard the Gospel was saved by the grace of God, my rebellion left me 
instantly and forever. And rebellion is a thing that I know nothing about today. I will not rebel against my God. He is my Lord, my Savior, my God. And because I love Him, I will not rebel against Him. So rebellion took place in the heart of Adam, instigated through the woman as she led Adam to eat of the tree. Now I would have you to notice also the environment in which Adam was placed. There are those that tell us today that all that's wrong with man is his environment. If you could just put him in a better environment, he wouldn't sin. And the reason that men sin is because they're born in the ghetto. Or they're born on the wrong side of the railroad tracks. Or they just were born in a bad environment. My friend, that's a lie of Satan. Man sins because man is a sinner by nature. His environment has nothing to do with it. I want you to notice that God placed Adam in a perfect environment. He was in the Garden of Eden. He had a perfect place to live. He had perfect neighbors. No neighbors. And he was in a good environment. But it didn't affect him from sinning. And God placed them in a garden. Not in a city. Cities are evil. All of the cities, people that are sinful gravitate to the cities. And the cities are realms and cesspools of evil. I grew up in a small town. And we didn't know the evil that you learn in the cities. Cities are evil. There are good people in the cities, but evil people gravitate to the cities. Now, he did not put them in a desert. The environment was perfect, yet they sinned. This garden was cool, refreshing. It was a soothing tonic. There's nothing as soothing as a, a nice tropical garden. My wife saw to it that we have a tropical garden in our backyard. Lots of trees, lots of flowers, lots of plants. And it is refreshing to go out in the backyard and enjoy that tropical breeze, the coolness of the garden. <clears throat> So God placed him in the best environment he could have had. And yet, a man who had never yet sinned had some fatal flaw in his nature causing him to sin. It was rebellion. Now there were four things that originated in the garden. Number one, it was the beginning of man. There was no pre-adamant man. Adam was the first man, according to 1 Corinthians. The beginning of man, this genesis of all things, began in the book of Genesis and in the Garden of Eden. Secondly, it was the beginning of man's fellowship with God. There was no man before Adam, and therefore no man had ever had fellowship with God. It was the beginning of man's fellowship with God. And Adam lived in perfect fellowship until he sinned and fell. And if you're out of fellowship with God, it's not God's fault. It's ours. Thirdly, it was the beginning of sin. Sin had not entered the garden until the day that Adam chose to sin. It was the beginning of death. There would have been no death had Adam not sinned. The Bible says, You hath he quickened, that means made alive, who were dead in trespasses and in sins. <clears throat> it's hard to convince people that they're dead when they're walking around and they can see with their eyes and they can work with their hands and they can move with their feet. And when you tell them that they are dead in trespasses and sins, they say, Preacher, I'm not dead. Look at me, I'm not dead. And you know, Adam woke up the next morning and he fell of his hands and his feet and he could think and he could walk. 
I said, I thought God said I would die. But I'm fine. But he noticed one thing. He noticed he didn't have any desire to go to the gate and meet God when he come to visit. He noticed that the thought of God was dreadful to him. And he decided that if God came to the garden, he'd run hide in the bushes. And he also saw that he was naked. And he clothed himself with thick leaf garments. And that's man today in his unsaved state. He thinks he's alive. But in reality, he is spiritually dead. And the easiest way to determine that is do you have any love for God? If you do, it's because God has worked in your heart. If you don't have any love for God, it's because you're still in Adam, the first Adam. And then again, I take you to the second garden. The gospel in four gardens. The second garden is the garden of Gethsemane where Jesus suffered in a garden. There in the garden of Gethsemane, Jesus sweat, as it were, great drops of blood in His agony. I read in Luke 22, when Jesus had spoken these words, He went forth with His disciples over the brook Kidron, where there was a garden into which He entered with His disciples. And He came out and went as it was wont to the Mount of Olives. And his disciples also followed him into the Garden of Gethsemane. And he was withdrawn from them about a stone's cast and kneeled down and prayed, saying, Father, if, it thy, if thou be willing, remove this cup from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but thine be done. And there appeared an angel unto him from heaven, strengthening him. And being in an agony, he prayed more earnestly, and his sweat was, as it were, great drops of blood falling down to the ground. The awful suffering of Gethsemane. Jesus was alone. The disciples were a distance away. There alone in the garden of uh, he prayed to his father. He needed his father's strength. He was weak. He was assaulted by Satan. Blood was oozing from the pores of his skin. He was in an agony. An agony such as no man has ever known. For there in the Garden of Gethsemane, he looked into the cup that the Father was going to press to His lips. And as He looked into that cup, His holy soul revolted against it. What was the cup? It was the sin of all His people. And it was to be pressed to His lips. And He was to drink it. And He had never tasted sin. He had never known sin. But here the man, Christ Jesus, is looking into the cup and he sees the adultery and he sees the drunkenness and he sees the filth of all of the people that he came to redeem. And his soul shrank back and he said, My Father, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not my will but thine be done. Then he went on to Calvary to willingly drink that cup. And on the cross, he drank it to the fullest degree. And as Mr. Spurgeon says, he drank damnation dry on the cross of Calvary. But there, in an agony, he prays. Winston Churchill saw in the pre-World War II days the dark storm clouds that were gathering over Europe as Nazi Germany rose to power. And he saw the war gathering. And he wrote a book to warn the people of Great Britain. And he titled the book, The Gathering Storm. Here the Lord Jesus Christ has been aware 
for months now of the gathering storm. The dark clouds of storm are hanging over his head and he's gathering closer and closer to him. The gathering storm. The crucifixion has been looming larger and larger. And now it breaks with all its fury in the Garden of Gethsemane. And it will ultimately run its course at Calvary's cross. He's going to experience what the old theologians call the Passio Magna, the grave suffering. The story commences in the upper room where Jesus has gathered His disciples together to observe the Passover supper. And there He took the elements of the Passover supper which were bread and wine and He used those to instigate and institute the Lord's Supper which we observe from day to day. Then He leaves the upper room with His disciples and they go out past the brook Kidron, past the great temple and into the garden of Gethsemane. He tells the disciples to wait here and He goes alone to pray. And there He's pressed nigh unto death. Almost crushed to death. And we cannot go any further with this because we are on holy ground. The great German theologian F.W. Krumacher said this about his suffering in the garden. He said, At this garden gate there stood a cherub who, if not with flaming sword, yet with repelling gesture, refused admittance and emphatically repeated our Lord's injunction to remain outside. And being in an agony. In the Greek it is agonai. And it comes from the word agon. Which means contest and conflict. A.T. <clears throat> Robertson, the great Greek scholar said, <clears throat> Satan pressed Jesus harder than ever before. His human tissues were literally disintegrating under the great stress that he was under. It was a thrombosis, a rupture of the blood vessels in the body. And some poet has written, the powers of hell united press and squeezed his heart and bruised his breast. What dreadful conflict raged within when sweat and blood forced through his skin. I take you to a third garden. The Gospel in the garden. First of all, Jesus died in a garden. John 19.41 Now in the place where He was crucified, there was a garden. So we know that Jesus was crucified in a garden because John 19.41 tells us that. The first Adam died in a garden. The last Adam likewise died in a garden. And not only did Jesus die in a garden on a cross, but in the second place, Jesus was buried in a garden. On the cross, he experiences that awful cup that he saw in Gethsemane. And now on the cross, in a garden, again, he receives the full extent of the wrath of God, the judgment of Almighty God, falls upon his head. And God turns away from him. And he cries, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Jesus was forsaken of God upon the cross for a brief moment of time. And then that brief moment of time when He was made sin, when all the judgment of God fell upon His head, when He accepted willingly and voluntarily the judgment of taking our place on the cross of Calvary. 
He died on a cross in a garden. In the second place, not only did He die in a garden, but He was buried in a garden. I read in John 19, 41, Now in the place where He was crucified, there was a garden. And in the garden a new sepulcher, wherein was never man yet laid. There they laid Jesus because of the Jews' preparation day for the sepulcher was nigh at hand. In the same place where He hung on a cross in a garden, now He is buried in a garden. It says so in John 19.41. In the place where He was crucified, there was a garden. So He died in a garden. He was buried in a garden. You say, can you go any further with that? Yes, we can. Jesus arose from the dead in a garden. In John chapter 20 and verse 15, that early morning, the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene came to claim the body of the Lord Jesus Christ, thinking that He was dead. And she saw a man standing in that early dawn, it was misty and foggy. She could only see the outline of a man. And she said to him, as he asked her this question, Woman, why weepest thou? Whom seekest thou? Now I want you to notice this verse. She, supposing him to be the gardener, the gardener. Where do you find a gardener? Out on the desert? No. In a wilderness? No. Where do you find a gardener? You find a gardener in a garden. That's where he works. That's where he stays. A gardener works in a garden. And she came and saw the risen Christ standing before her. And when He spoke to her, then she understood it was Jesus risen from the grave. He arose from the dead in a garden. For I delivered, says Paul, unto you first of all that which also I received, how that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures, and that He was buried, that He rose again the third day according to the Scriptures. Here we have the resurrection of Jesus. It means that He arose in fact, not in theory. I grow weary with these preachers that talk about the theory of the resurrection. The resurrection was not a theory. It was a fact. The great Christian scientist, Sir Michael Faraday, was dying. Some journalists came to his bedside to talk with him, knowing that he was a professing Christian. And they asked him, what are your speculations of life after death? And his answer was, speculations? I know nothing about speculations. I'm resting on certainties. I know that my Redeemer liveth, and because He lives, I shall live also. Away with your speculations, your uncertainties, your doubts. They're not worthy of the mind of a man. What's worthy of a man's mind is to give acquiescence to the fact of the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. He lives today. You ask me how I know He lives? He lives within my heart. No speculation about it. If you've ever been saved, you know Jesus is alive. He lives in my heart today. And I still remember the night 60 years ago when He walked into my heart and life. He was real. He's been real to me for these 60 years. And He will always be real to me. Not only is it a fact, it's a scriptural fact. 
1 Corinthians says, Now is Christ risen from the dead. It's not only a scriptural fact, it's a philosophical fact. When they came to arrest Jesus, they didn't arrest Him. They went back. And the commander-in-chief said, Why didn't you bring Him? I sent you to arrest Jesus. Why didn't you bring Him? And they said, If you had heard Him, you would know why we didn't bring Him. Never man spake like this man. That was their answer. It was a ceremonial fact. Baptism and the Lord's Supper are two ceremonies that attest to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. It's also a prophetic fact. Jesus rose from the many Scriptures that tell us that He would rise from the grave. It's a historical fact. We date our checks today. Anno Domini, A.D. and B.C. He divided the calendar. He's in charge of the calendar. It's an ecclesiastical fact. The church stands today because Jesus lives. Why is the Trinity Baptist Church here this morning? Because Jesus lives. Because Jesus sent me here to build a, a Baptist church. And He works in this church from week to week. And we see it in week to week as this church in the hands of Almighty God works the work of God. It's an ecclesiological fact. And then it's a psychological fact. How would you explain the conversion of these disciples? They were unbelieving even while they followed Jesus. They were unbelieving. But when they saw Him alive from the grave, that dispelled all their doubts. You take the study of human behavior, the study of psychology, and you have no answer to psychology unless you believe that Jesus rose again. And then it's a typological fact. Jonah, out of the belly of the whale, three days and three nights in the heart of the earth, and then out of the belly of the whale, Jesus three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. As Jonah was three days and three nights in the belly of the whale. Jonah is a type of Christ. It's a typological fact. It's a soteriological fact. The Bible says, If thou shalt believe in thine heart that God hath raised Him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. Oh, you say it couldn't be that simple. It was that simple for me. And it can be that simple for you. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. Now I know there's a whole lot involved in believing. But believing is God's way of salvation. You have to believe in Him. You have to believe that God raised Him from the dead. If thou shalt believe in thine heart that God hath raised Him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. You have to believe that to be saved. Then it's a theological fact. His resurrection is the keystone. It's the archstone that holds up the wall. You take away the resurrection of Christ and you have taken away Christianity. If Christ be not risen from the dead, Paul cries, then we are all men most miserable. And I tell you, if I had any idea that Christ did not rise from the dead, I would be the most miserable man in the world. But I don't have to worry about that because when He came into my life, He was real to me and I know He lives. A dead Christ cannot save anybody. Then it's an experiential fact. Christ liveth in me. It's a literary fact. The four Gospels are the greatest story ever written. Fulton Orsler wrote a book called The Greatest Story Ever Lived. Ever Lived. All of the literary gems gather around Jesus. In the cross of Christ I glory, gather, gathering around the wrecks of time, all the light of sacred story gathers round His head sublime. You see, Jesus is the center of everything that is of any use. 
then it's an essential fact. It's incontrovertible, it's undeniable, it's irrefutable. You cannot break down the truth of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. It's an impossibility. There were two men, Lord Lytton and Gilbert. These two men belonged to an atheist club in London. And they stalked continually at the resurrection of Christ. And they said, we will go to the land of Palestine and we will disprove the resurrection of Christ. So these two men went to Palestine. They visited the Garden of Gethsemane, which you can go visit today. They visited the tomb, the empty tomb. And they went and visited the place where He hung upon the cross. And they visited Jerusalem, the places where He preached. And they studied minutely every aspect of Jesus' life on earth. And they came back to London. And they came to the meeting of the atheists. And they said, tell us what you learned. Give us the proof that Jesus didn't rise from the dead. And Lord Littleton stood to his feet and said, I have to tell you that when I studied all the evidence, I became a Christian. And the other one stood and said, I too have studied all the evidence and I too have become a Christian. Well, that kind of shook up the atheist meeting that day. But you see, anybody that will study the evidence will irrefutably be brought to feel and see that Jesus lives today. It's a judicial <laughs> fact because by His resurrection, He will judge the world in righteousness one day. And then in the last, I take you to the fourth garden. Jesus not only died in a garden, He not only was buried in a garden, He not only rose from a garden, but He also ascended from a garden. As the disciples met with Jesus on the Mount of Olives, suddenly He began to disappear from their sight and He went up out of their sight. And an angel came down and said, Ye men of Galilee, why stand ye here gazing up into the heavens? Know ye not that this same Jesus whom was crucified shall come again in like manner. This same Jesus. Verse 12 says, And they returned unto Jerusalem from the Mount of Olives. Where was the garden? In the Mount of Olives. They returned to Jerusalem from the Mount of Olives. When Jesus rose that early morning, He said to Mary, Touch me not, for I am not yet ascended to my Father. But go to my brethren and say unto them, I ascend unto my Father and your Father and to my God and to your God. That evening in the upper room, He appeared to the disciples and He said to doubting Thomas, Touch me! Put your hand in the print of the nails in my hands. Thrust your hand into my side, but be not faithless, but believing. And Thomas didn't need to do that. He said, My Lord and my God. Now, why did he tell Mary that morning before he ascended? Not to touch him. And why did he tell the disciples that evening to touch him? Because he had ascended to heaven. And why did He ascend to heaven? To place His blood upon the mercy seat. In the Old Testament, there was a tabernacle and a temple. And in that tabernacle and temple was a little Ark of the Covenant. And the lid was called a mercy seat. And once a year, the high priest went into the holy place. And there he sprinkled the blood of atonement of an animal on the mercy seat. 
And under that mercy seat was the broken Ten Commandments. And that blood covered from God's sight those broken Ten Commandments. That's why the blood was placed on the mercy seat year after year. But that blood could never take away sin. The Bible said, but this man, after he had offered one sacrifice for sin forever, sat down at the right hand of God. And Jesus went up into heaven, placed His blood on the mercy seat in heaven, and came back down to the disciples, and He said, now you can touch Me. You see, when the high priest was going into the tabernacle to place the blood on the mercy seat, no one was allowed to touch Him. No one could touch the high priest when he was on his way to place the blood on the mercy seat. And that's why Jesus, our great high priest, said to Mary, Touch me not. I have not yet ascended to my Father. He was on his way to place the blood on the mercy seat. And the blood of Jesus Christ did not perish. It's still vital today. It still can wash away sin today. It still can bring you to eternal life today. If, as some of these preachers tell us, that the blood ran down into the sand and perished, then they're hypocrites when they stand, stand and sing, what can wash away my sin? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. What can make me whole again? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. And when they mention the blood, if the blood perished, why preach the blood? Why preach something that perished? I tell you this morning, it is the blood of Jesus Christ that saves a sinner. The blood did not perish. It was imperishable. It was the blood of God. And it did not perish. And it's in heaven today on the mercy seat in heaven. If you read the book of Hebrews, you will see that the tabernacle and the temple furniture was only a picture and a type of the reality of heaven. There is a mercy seat in heaven. And there is reality in heaven. And the blood of Jesus Christ is on the mercy seat in heaven. And Jesus Himself is the mercy seat. So Jesus ascended from a garden. I close with this. This fourth garden. There is a heavenly garden. It is called paradise. This garden is the resting place of the saints until the resurrection of their bodies and is located in heaven. 2 Corinthians chapter 12, the Apostle Paul verifies that heaven is called paradise. He says, I knew a man in Christ, referring to himself, about 14 years ago, whether in the body I cannot tell, or whether out of the body I cannot tell, God knoweth, such a one, caught up to the third heaven. Now if you know anything about heaven, you know that the third heaven is the heaven where God lives. God dwells in the third heaven. And Paul was caught up to the third heaven. And then he says in verse 4, how that he was caught up into paradise. So the third heaven is paradise. That's what it's called and heard unspeakable words which it is not lawful for a man to utter. So 1 Corinthians 12, 2 says he was caught up to the third heaven and the fourth verse says he was caught up into paradise. They are one in the same place. He just gave us a word to identify heaven. The word paradise comes from an oriental word paradisos. It was first used by the historian Ex Nothin. And in the Septuagint, the translators used it as the Garden of Eden in Genesis 
But how do I really know that heaven is paradise? Let me read it to you in Luke 23, verse 42. There was a dying thief hanging beside Jesus. He was a vile, wicked thief. He deserved the crucifixion that he was undergoing. But when he heard Jesus pray, Father, forgive them. They know not what they do. It broke his heart. And he turned and believed on the Lord Jesus Christ. And he said unto Jesus, Lord, remember me when thou comest into thy kingdom. And Jesus said, I'm going to give you something better. When I come back, I'll set up my kingdom. But I'm going to give you something better. Jesus said unto him, Verily I say unto thee, Today, not when I come back to set up my kingdom, but today thou shalt be with me in paradise. Paradise is heaven. And Jesus took that dying thief that day to heaven. Paradise. You say, what's that got to do with the garden? Simply this, there's a garden in paradise. Revelation 22, And He showed me a pure river of water of life, clear as crystal, proceeding out of the throne of God and of the Lamb. In the midst of the street of it, and on the other side of the river, was there a tree of life, trees grow in gardens, which bear twelve manner of fruits. These are fruit trees in heaven and yielded her fruit every month. And the leaves of the tree were for the healing of the nations. Then again in Revelation, He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. To him that overcometh will I give to eat of the tree of life which is in the midst of the paradise of God. There shall be no more curse, but the throne of God and the Lamb shall be in it, and His servants shall serve Him, and they shall see His face, and His name shall be in their foreheads, and they shall have no need of candle, neither light of the sun. There shall be no night there, for the Lord God giveth them light, and they shall reign forever and ever. Four gardens. The garden of testing, Eden. The Garden of Suffering, Gethsemane. The Garden of Crucifixion, Joseph's Tomb. The Garden of Glory, Paradise. I wonder this morning if you've been with Him in the Garden. I love that old hymn. I come to the Garden alone while the dew is still on the roses. The voice I hear Falling on my ear, the Son of God discloses. And He walks with me, and He talks with me, and He tells me I am His own. And the joy we share as we tarry there, none other has ever known. Well, you can know that this morning by receiving the Lord Jesus Christ. Putting your faith in His cleansing blood that saves from sin. As we ask the penis to come, we'll sing verse 23, I believe it is. Six. Verse 26. It might be that someone here today would like to confess his faith in Jesus Christ. Or you might like to put your membership in this church. In whatever way the church receives members. By baptism, by letter, by transfer of your membership from another Baptist church or whatever it may be, as we sing, would you come? Number 26. Just as I am, stand together, please, without one plea, but that thy blood was shed for me.
prayer. Be sure to get